a wedding song. <laughs> Just over the border. Oh, nice. That's a good one. What's a good one, Nicole? <laughs> <laughs> the Rocky song apparently hey. was John's wedding I song. Came out in our wedding. Nice. A great one. Introduced oh, hey. it for the first time and it was playing. It's great. Yeah. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Let, you know what? Let's just, we're, we're walking right into a conversation. We're talking about John's wedding song. John, let, let's, let's go there. Let, <laughs> hey, you know what? That might be our new question, Nicole. Hey, what was your wedding song? So, John, what was your wedding song? So, the actual wedding song for the first dance was Nickelback's Never Gonna Be Alone. And I remember my wife and I practiced mm. like crazy just to not look yeah. foolish. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we were first introduced as husband and wife, you know, you walk in, it was, yeah. it was the Rocky song. It was the Rocky oh, song. Oh man. You guys are yep. a fierce couple. It was one of, you know, Love it. I didn't get a lot in the wedding besides my wife, but the, you know, and I got an ice cream cake, but I got the that <laughs> song. You had ice cream cake at your wedding. That's I cool. Did. That's cool. She surprised yes. me with an ice cream cake. Did you, nice. did you wear any of it or were you guys polite to each other? They couldn't cut it because they left it in the freezer too long. But eventually, some <laughs> ended up on my nose and stuff like that. But yeah, okay. awesome. Oh man! All right. Well, hey, let's dig in. So this is a special program. We usually mm -hmm. don't go on Wednesdays, but man, for this fine young man, we are definitely mm -hmm. going to go on Wednesday. So happy Wednesday, everybody! And just what an honor, thrill to introduce our dear friend John Baglino mm -hmm. from Obtessa. How's that for a little swag, John? So Cole and I were in Chicago last week and we were with we were we were doing some lives with manufacturers. And it's so much better site, Nicole. And what was the feedback? They're like, Yeah, Kurt, you got to do something with your background. So I just said <laughs> a little here today. And yeah. it looks like it. I'm gonna stand over here so we can go here. So all right, guys, welcome to the program. Nicole, how are you today? Anything exciting in your world today? Ooh, what's exciting in my world? Well, you know, something crazy happened this morning. A bird flew in my house this morning. And I don't know if that's ever happened to you, but it was utterly terrifying. <laughs> I opened my garage and a bird had gotten trapped in my garage. And I opened the door to go out to my car. And all of a sudden, this bird just flies in the house. And um, so that was, you know, it was like the birds, you know, that old movie, The Birds. I felt like I was being overtaken by the birds. I don't know if you can. Yeah. Here it is right there. Yes. And wow. so, you know, not to digress too much, but it was just fascinating because this poor bird, it found a windowsill and it kept on trying to go out the window. So it kept on hitting itself over and over again on this window. Meanwhile, right underneath the window was a door wide open where it could just fly free. And I just kept looking in and I'm like, this is like a corollary for life. You know, we just hit our heads against the, the window, not knowing that the path forward is just right below like us. Feet below, so, right? so anyway, that was a, it was interesting. It took us 25 minutes to get the bird out, but finally, finally we did. It only took me, my husband and my eight-year-old daughter to, uh, to finagle that bird out of the house. Well, it's so. a, it's a family effort, a family affair, yeah. a team effort. So speaking of team effort, Hey, mm. we've got the team here today, Val. Happy wow. Wednesday. Thank you, my friend. Hey, we've got Whitney Houston in the house. So mm -hmm. wonderful to be here together. Hey, we've got Kevin. We just had Kevin. We just hey. had Kevin. We great had to see you. Week. So Kevin, yeah. thank you for joining us. And I know like the great team at Gen Alpha has just partnered with Uptessa. So all right, without further ado, John, let's dig in. And a couple of things, you know, you and I became fast friends and just big thing that I love and admire is like, you're just a fierce networker. You break, you've got the hashtag right there, hunting relationships. And I love you. You, we talk a lot about, Hey, how do we out teach the competition? So let's right. go here. Like just share some insight on like your networking style, your networking strategy. How are you the hunter of relationships? And let's, let's go there first. Yeah. So the hunt relationships actually was coined on this show and I didn't even know I mean, I think when I first said it, I think you and you, Kurt and, and Damon were just like completely awestruck. Like yeah. Pens were dropping. Mics yeah. turned off. It was in, it was insane. Right. And it really does really go to the point of people want to connect with people at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you understand that there's someone behind the keys or someone behind a brand or someone that's could be struggling that might need some help, like you have to meet them where they are. And you have to look to connect with them at a deeper level, right? Like I'm a sales and marketing leader at a, at Uptessa. Yep. I'm not going to get a lot if I continue to just preach, 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 and just shove down your throat that I want to sell you something. But 
I have to understand what your needs are. I have to understand who you are as a person. I have to understand what's going on in your world. Because at the end of the day, it's not about me. It's about you. And the more mm -hmm. I learn about you, the better I can be as your provider, vendor, and, and, and the relationship can move forward. So really what LinkedIn, as a prime example, I look to have as many conversations as I can. Um, I look, well, I'm not the pitch slap people, but <laughs> the, the viable conversations, like if you come on my profile, I'm going to ask you if there's something I could do for you. Like you didn't happen to just stumble upon the profile. Something caught your eye. Um, so I want to understand what that is. And if it's just you're passing through, totally fine. I just want to know. I'm just a curious person. Um, or there could be something like someone actually needs something. And I reach out to them and they're like, oh, they actually, you know, he's actually acknowledging me. And I really attribute it to uh, one of the guys in our community, Dave Chrysler. I said to him, I said, Think of your LinkedIn profile as your digital storefront. If someone walks into a store and you're greeted, do you immediately turn around and walk out? No, you're going to continue on into the store to continue what you needed, right? You needed mm -hmm. that shirt or a pair of shorts or that bread or whatever you needed. If someone greets you when they come onto your profile, you're not going to go, oh, they saw me. No, there's a reason. Tell me. Tell me what the reason is. Mm -hmm. um, I've done that to you, Kurt. Mm -hmm. jokingly i've done that to you nicole and it was just oh i was just looking for something you know kurt you do your fear set you know researching and different things mm -hmm. so that was it you're like oh no no brother i'm just passing through just looking just doing some research ahead of our show no problem mm -hmm. but at least i know there's something else that wasn't you know going on i do it with 95 percent of the people um that that happen to come on the profile mm -hmm. yeah Interesting. Yeah. One of the things I really love about um, you, John, as a networker is just you're always really looking out for the people around you. And you've done that for me, too. Like you'll you're really great at connecting other people. So you've connected me with many other people and said, hey, Nicole, or you've made introductions of people. That I just met with a, a wonderful gentleman yesterday, Jim Mayer, who you introduced me to. And you've done that so many times. Mm -hmm. And so I really appreciate that you really show the way in terms of really trying to build those connections with other people in your network so that they can grow too. And if you see somebody that might be a good connection, you, um, you, you're really good about thinking about other people that might be a good connection for them. And I really yeah. love that go-giver side of you. And mm -hmm. I, so, sometimes they're not always the, the right connections, right? Like yeah. sometimes it's like I grasp at straws and, you know, it's just like, is this going to work? Mm -hmm. But I always put it out there and just say, does this make sense? Right. Yeah. And I give you my convoluted th thought process. And if it makes sense, great. Um, you know, I did it with you mentioned it earlier, like Kevin and, and Chris Harrington, Jen Alpha. I'm like, mm -hmm. just throwing out here. Here's my idea. Mm -hmm. And now we're in a partnership. Right. Like so my half brain shower thought became actually something that's going to drive <laughs> and, and help businesses um, as we mature there. Very nice. Yeah, I love that. And, it, you know, we have a tagline. We would do our workshops and webinars, you know, like closed mouths don't get fed. Closed mm -hmm. mouths don't get fed. And so, you know, you know, our show manufacturing e-commerce success, we're all very passionate about helping manufacturers. Speaking of, Hey, Diane Beyer, we were just talking Diane. about hey, hey, Diane. So Diane, if you missed it, John's wedding song, his intro wedding song was the Rocky song right in your backyard in Philadelphia. So mm -hmm. welcome, Diane, and again, guys, drop a note in the chat box. Let us know that you're there. If you haven't connected already, you must Please connect with John Baglino. You will be, you'll thank us later. He's an amazing networker. John, when you came on the program before, we talked about like your leadership, where it comes from. And we're going to dig, we're going to take a deep dive into master production scheduling. Before we go there, I just want a couple of things that you just said that were just so potent, so powerful. With your networking, it's like, you know, hey, I'm not looking to do the sales pitch. And, and we're, I think Brittany, Whitney, Whitney got it. Whitney yeah. got it. Let's say no <laughs> to the pitch slaps, right? So that's uh, that's fantastic. But you know, you sh another thing, you dropped tons of of value bombs on the first time you came on the program. You shared that somebody doesn't need to earn your trust. Mm -hmm. You mm. give them that trust. They have to break it to unearn it, but they don't need to earn it. Can you just let's go there for a minute and apply that? How you you know networking your coworkers, your leadership. Uh, let's go there for a minute. Yeah, it, it's something that I've learned over my career of leading different teams and different personalities. I don't like to micromanage. I like to just give you a task, and I trust that it's going to get done. If I bring you on on, on my team, there's a culture on the team. Like we're all marching towards the same goal. And it's really hard. And I'm going to say it's not really hard to break the trust, but I give you that trust, 
right? I have to trust my team. I have to trust people around me. And everyone just has to do what they need to do. And I don't need to be over top of you for you to get things done, right? So the other piece is like breaking that trust is if I expect something of you and you don't do it or you lie. Like that's when it's kind of mm-hmm. like we, yeah. I become ice, right? <laughs> I'm your friend until I'm not kind of thing. But that's the same way in business, right? Like just think about it that way. Like if you're going to use a provider, you're trusting that they're going to come up on their word and that they're going to do what they say they're going to do. And you're going to just leap of faith, throw it out there, and then you'll wait and see how the things kind of shake out. Mm-hmm. So I give that to you. I even have a new um, new girl on my team, a new intern for the summer. And I said the exact same thing. She's like, I don't really. And I'm like, yeah. I was like, here's what we're going to do. Here's the five things. Here's the expectations. Mm-hmm. That's that's really it. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm here for questions and other items, but you know, she, she shows up on time. We work on projects together. We update together. She attends meetings. That's, that's really it. Uh, there's really no reason for you not to trust someone. So I'd rather trust before, um, you know, I guess that's just how I go about it to start it off. Yeah. I love that. So, all right. So let's slide in here. We're, we're here to geek out and just really jam out about master production scheduling. Mm -hmm. And I, and and like, how does this all tie together? It's teaching, it's educating, it's networking, it's understanding Mm -hmm. what the, what the challenge is. You know, we're not really selling anything. It's like, how do we dedicate ourselves to helping other people achieve their goals, get the ball in the end zone, all the above. And, and what, what are we all selling John just said it. We're all selling one word and one word only. We are selling trust. trust. We are selling trust, you know, and it doesn't matter if you're selling widgets, you're selling products, you're selling retail, you're selling ice cream at the local ice cream. Hope everybody go get ice cream over 4th of July weekend, by the way. That's a good thing to do. Nicole, let's start. Let's let's go into some questions here on master production scheduling with our dear friend, John. I love this mantra. It's been, I've been thinking about this a little while and it's it's the whole teach don't preach right teach don't mm-hmm. preach you know i love yeah. i just love it so let's talk about um production planning and scheduling so if i'm a manufacturer and you know i've got to figure out you know how i'm going to make sure i get all these widgets made there's so many things that go into that planning process so maybe john let's just start with what is a master production schedule And what are the steps to creating one? What are, you know, what are those steps look like if I'm, if, you know, if I'm the ops manager at a plant, what do I need to be thinking about? What are the, you know, the the steps that would, would need, I need to tackle to get that schedule created? Right. No, perfect. And so a master production schedule, you might, there's an acronym. We were talking about this pre-show M P S M is a Mary P is in Peter S is in Sam M P S uh, for the sake of this, this conversation. So it's any manufacturer that's looking to make their product and understand when they can make it and in the quantities needs a master production schedule. Yeah. It's plain and simple. Right. What goes into those steps? There's a lot. There's a lot that goes into it. And it's a one thing I'll say it's it's a fluid situation, right? Because you take things, for example, the first thing, your demand. Okay. Now, demand, when I say demand to a manufacturer. Demand changes daily. Demand changes weekly. Demand changes monthly, depending on who you are and what you're doing. Think about seasonality. If you're mm-hmm. making lawnmowers, you are highly skewed to seasonality because you know when people are going to want your product versus not. Right. Mm-hmm. So demand and the fluctuations in demand, there's pretty much the first couple of steps is to understand those uh, pieces of it. And how would a man, this is great. How would a manufacturer go about identifying demand like I, I assume one of the things would be to look at your sales data historically mm-hmm. maybe as you mentioned seasonality look you know looking at market trends number of orders but what are some things like what are some I guess data points that manufacturers can be looking for to really get a good pulse on what their demand is for the product yeah you can look at your current or or previous demands over a certain amount of time the other piece, if you're just starting out, you have to look at and do some research. Look at your competition. Look at others in the space. Okay. And do do the research to understand seasonality that might be impacting there, right? Mm-hmm. If you're starting a business or a new manufacturer or starting or a manufacturer thinking about a different product line, you have mm-hmm. to do your research to understand what's my addressable market, what's my mm-hmm. possible margins, what yeah. can I expect to happen to my my own operations as a result. 
what are the impacts, positive and negative, of, of doing that? So it needs to start your research and also needs to be part of your data analysis, right? You yeah. have to understand um, expectations, set goals, understand what you're going to measure, how you're going to measure it, when you're going to measure it, uh, the re report back to yourself and also your business. Wow. Yeah. And I'm sure sales and marketing is involved in that heavily because they're going to be able to help you identify what's coming down the pipeline. Yeah. Right. There's also trial and error. Right. You also have yeah. to just, again take that leap and say, well, I'm going to yeah. try and sell these in this, yeah. this quantities and I'm going to just try it out and see what happens. Am I going to be left with too much uh, supply left or am I going to be completely depleted and scrambling? Don't know until mm. you try. Well, yeah. that's a great point, John. And, and, the, and the thing is for like small manufacturers, especially like we're constantly talking about the, the entrepreneur, the business owner that's thrown on multiple hats all day. They're their mm -hmm. own marketing. They're their own sales finance. But when you do have a little bit of a bigger company, you know, John, you're going to like sales. Like I want the inventory on the shelf because like I'm, yeah. I'm commission based. This is how I feed my family. I need right. product in, in the, in, you know, accounting is saying like, Wait a minute! Time <laughs> off, man. Like we've got yeah. a, somebody's got to pay for the raw material and the goods, and like we've got accounts payable, and mm -hmm. we're choking on inventory. You know, Damon is always talking about cash flow. You know, in his posts and what have you. So I mean, there's a fine balance, and that's like, and that's again, like data and information is so is power, right? And that's where you right. kind of come in and save the day of bring. So let's go there a little bit deeper, if you could, about bringing that sales accounting. How do we marry that balance? Yeah, the, ne the next piece after you understand your demand and seasonality and fluctuations is aligning your inventory and your mm -hmm. internal capacities, yeah. right? You mm -hmm. have to understand, okay, like I said, I want to, I have a thousand widgets on the shelf. When can I move those thousand widgets? Or when can I add those widgets to the other widgets to make the bigger widget, right? Mm -hmm. When is the right time to do those types of things? So you have to understand your inventory levels, understand what you have, not only in operation, in stock, but also what's incoming, right? Mm -hmm. That's the other piece of it as well. Like I said, it's a fluid situation. If your accounting team or your procurement team is ordering ahead and you forget, you're going to have a truck at your door and go, wait, what's on this truck? What, wait, what happened? What did I do? Yeah. So you have to really understand your demand then ties into your inventory then your capacities, understand what you're going to do, what the goods you have on hand or that are coming towards mm -hmm. to you. The mm -hmm. one caveat I would say that threw a lot of manufacturers in flux was shortages, right? Yeah. I don't have to dive into the different shortages that we've all ex experienced, but a lot of companies overbought inventory and now are left with inventory that they don't know, don't know what to do with, right? Mm -hmm. They're just sitting there and it's eating up valuable warehouse space. It's eating up valuable real estate. It's a pain point because it's already spent. It's not helping bring money in. Some of these items could have expiration dates that then become waste. So it's completely, it's again, a fluid situation here, but it's all goes into that, that master production schedule, understanding what's going on in the operation from end to end. Right. And yeah. we're just, we're just scratching the surface. Oh yeah. So that first step I hear is you got to know your demand forecasts mm -hmm. and then you got to put together an inventory plan. You know, you've got to really understand what your forecasts are, what your desired stock levels are, your safety stock requirements. You know, like what's the minimum that you want to get to before you need to make any adjustments, right? right? And what your storage capacity is. So that inventory plan. What about like production constraints? Let's talk about that a little bit. Like that seems like it'd be a big part of production planning, of putting together an MPS, a master production schedule. So talk a little bit about constraints. What are some examples of some common constraints and what can manufacturers be thinking about to plan for those constraints as they're building out there? Their schedule. Yeah, absolutely. And constraints, again, we're going to define, right? So a constraint mm -hmm. for me could mean a couple of things, but there's, so the definition, so a constraint could be a business rule or a business KPI, right? Okay. So you're constrained by, you have to do X by Y to satisfy a customer delivery date, right? Yeah. Another constraint could be, I only have eight hours in a day to run my machines, or I only have 10 hours in a day to run my, my capacity or my constraint is I have a finite amount of time to do something, whether it be because of machine, whether it be for a person, or you can be constrained by your inventory. You only have a thousand buckets. Yeah. You can't ask for or create a schedule that requires a thousand and one. You physically and literally don't have a thousand and one. You only have a thousand. So constraints can mean a number of things. 
from a master production schedule standpoint, the constraints are the latter, right? It's the constraints on your production environment. You have three lines. You can't schedule four lines. If you only have five people on staff, you can't plan for a six person, right? You are constrained by what you have. Mm-hmm. Aspiration wise, you can look at it, but again, that's a totally different conversation. So the constraint is your parameters, right? Yeah. I'm a manufacturer with five lines, team of 10, and inventory of a thousand units cycling every month. Those are your constraints. From that, you then look at what you're able to produce, your goods, and get everything out. Yeah. I mean, constraints, I mean, just generally can apply to any business, right? Every business has constraints. And so I think that's so important. You know, once you've got, you know, your demand forecasts and you understand your inventory is like, what are the kind of the barriers or what is the kind of like constraints that I have to work within in order to put together the schedule? Awesome. Okay. Mm -hmm. What about, okay. And we talked about stock levels too. So once you have your inventory plan, you understand and have identified what your production constraints are. And you said that very clearly, like how long is the machine going to be running? How many machines do you have? How many people are going to be working on the line? You know, what materials do you have available to you? And Mm -hmm. lead times too, I imagine it would be another big constraint for manufacturers. Right. Man, there's just like, as as we're talking about this, John, there's so many variables that go into this. (laughs) this production schedule, like yeah. and so much of it is so fluid, as you mentioned, that, you know, I can see how this would be really overwhelming to really have like a, you know, a really very clear, well-organized, well-oiled machine. What right. happens, what are some other things that, um, that need to happen next in order to create that master production schedule? Once you've identified these forecasts, production constraints, inventory plan, stock think- levels. What, the, what ne- else? the next piece is your time, right? You have to mm-hmm. understand your timing. Like how long is everything going to be running or what is your time horizon for your production, right? Everything I laid out, are we looking at it? This is a week to week. Mm-hmm. Some manufacturers are running daily. Some are running week to week. Some plan out further uh, month to month, quarter to quarter, year to year kind of thing. And just look at it at that larger view and then they come down. So you have to define your timing, right? Because then mm-hmm. everything before it is impacted, right? Mm-hmm. If, you, if you're looking at over a year, your inventory number is going to be, well, here's the inventory I'm going to get in all of the calendar year 2023, mm-hmm. right? Or if your calendar year just reset, now it's like, okay, over the next from June to June 24, here's where my inventories and numbers are going to be. But then you have to look at and say, okay, that's the year look. Let's go down by a quarter. Mm-hmm. Let's go down by a month. And in each one depends on the fluctuations, the changes, the orders, the reorders, the expirations related to your inventory, right? So again, it's a fluid situation. It depends on what you want to measure and how you want to measure it at at that point. And once Mm. you get that timing down, now it's time to see feasibility. Everything before it. So we have identified five, maybe seven steps, right? Now everything you have to now say, okay, I'm going to generate my MPS, my master production schedule. Yeah. Now you got to check if it's feasible, right? And you can't, you, you wrote, I recommend not doing it in live states, live, because you don't want to impact like what's happening live on your production floor. So you want to like plan ahead mm-hmm. and kind of look okay. at it and say, okay, here's what I think is going to happen. And you kind of lay it out and see how it's going to flow before you publish it to your broader team. Right? Okay. So this you kind of pilot kinda, it, you do your test. You the pilot waters. it and see mm-hmm. like feasibility, like, can I produce, if I'm producing a thousand uh, products a month, can I produce four, can I support 4,000 products in a quarter? Yeah. Maybe if, and then you have to lay out the, the ifs, right? So now you have yeah. to increase capacities and things like that and, and other items. So now you start running into, okay, my demand saying one thing, my inventory levels are saying another, my capacities are saying another. Now my timing, now can I actually, is this actually feasible, right? And then if something goes wrong, you have to start back. So if the customer demand is saying they need 4,000 and your capacity only puts you at 3,500, well, now you have to figure something out. So now you have to go back and manually go back and adjust the schedule. You have to manually go back and adjust it. You have to figure out what needs to change. You have to align the team, right? So if you have to order more, you have to get more people involved. You probably have to get an approval because you're now contradicting your inventory over a certain time period. Mm -hmm. And that's also an added cost. So now you're looking at, okay, 
The demand is for an extra 500 units. What does that mean to my bottom line? Yeah. It means X dollar. Okay, but to produce that 500, it's going to cost me Y. Is the Y greater than the X? That doesn't make sense. But if the X is greater than the Y, what's my margin, right? So you have to think about all these different items. And then as that's all happening, <laughs> your production is still running, right? Yeah. These plans are made, I don't want to say in a silo, but they're sometimes made off to the side or in tandem with actual live production, right? Yeah. So you might have to, if a new order comes through or a new demand fluctuation hits, now you have to pull team members in and say, you need to help me understand what's going on here. Something, yeah. something happened. Something we didn't account for has gone on. And those disruptions are just that. That's a lot. So when you're working with companies that are trying to manage these production schedules, like how much resource do they usually need to have just purely to create and manage the schedule, let alone communicate it with all the different departments? Like this seems like it's a huge investment of labor to just keep it, keep it up and, and running properly. <laughs> Truth be told, you, I'm usually speaking to one really stressed out person <laughs> that's <laughs> trying to just keep all the plates spinning. Yeah. Um, but other times you have full teams of people, like three, four, five, sometimes 10 or more yeah. that are just dedicated to making sure all these steps are running and are working in tandem and are working in unison. And yeah. even with all that power behind it, disruptions throw everyone off. Oh. You can't plan for it. You can't. And again, that's the really stressed out one person or the team now has to figure out everything, all the different facets, right? And that's another piece of it. So to answer your question, yeah, it's usually one person is the owner of the MPS, the master production schedule, but sometimes it could be a team responsible that then filters it up to the business uh, to kind yeah. of execute from. Man, we're getting some lots of comments here. Yeah, so we got to we'll, turn it over. We'll, we'll, yeah. all, right. all right. How about, you know what? Dave Chrysler's in the house. Man. <laughs> Dave well, Chrysler, Mr. Mr. Love you. Oh, he says, How many mic? You know what, Dave? I like, I just threw my mic right it's, on the floor. It's, like, it's, it's like, automatic. It's just laying yeah. right down there. So, uh, thank you. And I, hey, I got to backtrack for a minute. So, keep the fire going here. But how about, you know, we get back to Rocky. And so Diane says, hey, I've got to run the yeah. art stairs. And Diane <laughs> and, and Whitney says, hey, it's better than drinking raw. You know, so and, uh, funny thing about the, the art stairs, Diane, I actually did that. Nice. And what I didn't realize or maybe didn't care, I didn't realize was I actually interfered with a wedding that was taking photos at the top of the stairs. <laughs> and then you have me just like doing a full sprint. And I'm just like, whoops. Oh my God. <laughs> so I got, so I was in a picture. John Buglino photobomb. That's all right. That's, that's you know, fine. I wouldn't expect anything different from you, John. You know, that's just the whole time. Cool. I was like, don't fall, don't fall, don't fall, don't fall. Cause everyone watches you as you do it yep. too. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, um, from Diane and we've got some other comments here. We're talking about constraints. I like this one here from Diane. Mm -hmm. Diane's an efficiency expert herself. Time mm -hmm. constraints, employee constraints, material constraints. Diane budget knows. Constraints. I mean, like yeah. we could, you know, like, I don't know, there's like this little thing that COVID came about, you know, you can have like acts of God, you can, have, you know, uh, tragedies. We've talked about um, on the show here, like, you know, going viral, you know, uh, we had a guest on and uh, I just showed her a clip last week where like she, uh, she met the woman that founded Spanx. What's her? What, uh, uh, Sarah Blakely. Thank Sarah you, Rickley. Sarah Blakely. Yeah. And mm -hmm. when she went on Oprah, man, like, you know, like, you know, so that's an extreme example, but like, you just got to be, how do you prepare for all these things, John? I mean, it's just, it's, it's so intense, right? Yeah. I mean, Dave Chrysler mentioned here that the, usually the person who's managing or the team are often an Excel super user. So that's a question I have is like, how do you yeah. manage a production mm -hmm. schedule? What platform are you using typically? And how do you communicate all of those changes and ingest all of the information? Because there's so many just departments and parts of the business that are involved in this planning, you know, the schedule that need to be, you need to, there needs to be a two way communication happening. And how do you manage that? Is that, I mean, I just Excel, like, how does that work? <laughs> it's exactly you know? it. Dave, Dave nailed it. And you, and you said it, it is, it's Excel. It's, oh man, and that's sometimes the more sophisticated, right? Is yeah. usually you get pen and paper, whiteboards, 
bulletin boards, notepad, whatever it is. Um, you know, I'm channeling my my Kenny McDermott here with the notepads and, and notebooks. But that's really what it is. It's really manual and it's tedious. And as far as um, how do you share it, that's also a problem because yeah. you would get version control. And I'm sure you've seen Excel spreadsheets mm -hmm. where it's like <laughs> final version three, final <laughs> yeah. version V4. It's like, wait, but it's the version control becomes a, a serious issue. Um, I bet, yeah. Especially and, if it's you're re, if you're working from a different version than someone else, and then what if you're ordering way too much inventory or not enough? I mean, I can just see the the that that could just completely catapult the number of disruptions that right. are happening. And I think that's and the other on piece top of, it. of the acts of God. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the other that's the other piece of it is if you have a team, the team might be siloed to where mm -hmm. they're focused, like say like they're focusing on inventory, and they're, right? And there's a disruption yeah. with inventory. Right. The, someone's not going to be able to supply the stock they thought they were until like two weeks. It's going to be delayed. Yeah. They don't tell you, the owner of the MPS or anyone else on the team, but they run and go tell procurement or purchasing or someone else on the team. Yeah. But then they fail to update that master document, that document mm -hmm. that everyone looks at or is supposed to be looking at. So yeah. then everyone's working and the, and the operations running. And you get to the line and now the line's like, what, wait, where's no more raw material? What happened? And yeah, then all of a sudden the team member says, oh yeah, it's not coming for another two weeks. We can't run the run. We can't complete it. So now oh. it's like, well, well now what do we do? And now the whole operation comes to a halt, right? So yeah. that version control, that shareability yeah. and that accountability goes completely out the window when you have, I think Dave said that big board or <laughs> that random Excel sheet sitting on someone's desktop somewhere, it really becomes an issue where that communication and those gaps in communication can really just cripple a manufacturer. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That, I mean, that's a huge pitfall is the communication gap. Drop the mic, the communication mm -hmm. gaps that happen with the master production schedule that can impact everything down the line. As Dave Chrysler mentioned is a huge pitfall. Mm -hmm. What are some other pitfalls with, with you know creating an, an, an MPS that manufacturers should be thinking about? What are some other issues that can arise? Any stories or examples you have from manufacturers? So, I, so the other piece is if you're on a team or if you're a sole person trying to generate these this schedule, you try maybe to, I don't want to say cut corners, but you try to do as, mo as much as you can in the quickest amount of time as you can. You might leave some things out. So you might mm -hmm. forget about one constraint or you might forget about one little piece of information like we're not running overtime anymore or we don't have that line because that line's not going to be operational it's going for maintenance so there are so many different things that are happening yeah. um you know a couple of common examples that i've come across and they might sound silly but they're examples people scheduling workers on a line that are on vacation yeah. individuals that leave early on a line and don't tell anybody or they just happen to leave like the last hour or two on their shift something happens right work life happens mm -hmm. um, other things like i said earlier inventory levels aren't where they're supposed to be someone forgot to update the inventory or someone fat fingered an inventory number <laughs> and and a thousand became ten thousand oh and the God. team's looking for the pallets and it's not there so there's yeah. so many different things that can go wrong. So the complexity of it, you have to make sure that you really dive into every facet of the business. And if you don't know, you have to ask questions, right? You have to double check. You have to triple check. Um, it's the same thing. Like if you're uh, working, you know, measure, measure twice, measure twice, cut once, mm -hmm. right? You have to do that. Um, you have to do that when you're, when your organization is like, can we run this? Can we commit to this customer? Yes. Well, let's double check if we can commit to the customer. Let's everyone just do it. Just do a sanity check. Make sure things are where they're supposed to be. Everyone's where they're supposed to be. Everything's working. Um, another example, like I said, uh, was an, an overtime issue. Another one, machine maintenance and downtime. Mm -hmm. So that's another piece of it where one manufacturer mistakenly ran their machine for two times as long as it could actually run they take any cooling oh, downtime oh yeah so the machine was only supposed to run at 10 hours and they ran mm -hmm. it for 14 but it only ran for 10 then broke for 10, two hours to cool and then went back online for two 
So what came off the machine was not what it was expected. So the team wow, had to yeah. rerun the numbers. So I have stories for days, but it's it's all <laughs> but it's all well, a matter of understanding that there's so many things from disruptions. Um, one of the jokes um, that I do have is, you know, the guarantees in life, death and taxes. The other one is that there's going to be a disruption in supply chain. That's is what we've be. learned. Drop the mic. You just have to. But that's what it is. It. You yeah. have to. You have to plan for a disruption. Like, and you got to think of the most obscure thing, right? And that's exactly what's going to go wrong in the operation. I and I've heard those stories. Yeah, and I'm as I think about it, you know, I keep thinking as you're sharing all these examples, is how much time it takes to manage the schedule, and think of all the people and all the time that you have to spend updating it and changing it and communicating with this department and that department. And making sure that this gets updated. I mean, I imagine people are in this thing all day long, you know, f- you know, and depending how big your plan is, you've got many people who are involved. And to me, I'm just thinking like the, t- the clock is ticking and there's all this time going by. And we know in manufacturing, like time is money. That time spent on that is time right. that's taken away from your bottom line, from your profitability as an organization. And just like, efficiency so you know that's that, that's what keeps running up is like the dollar signs of all that time being spent managing that production schedule. and to and to that point of managing that schedule it could take days to generate one yeah. like wow. these data yeah. inputs and this data is not easy to mm-hmm. calculate the data is not easy to to <laughs> obtain in certain organizations so if you're taking a couple of days to generate a schedule Mm-hmm. Are you looking back and double checking if your numbers that you got yesterday are still accurate? Yeah. Right. And that's, and we've come across that as well is if it takes you 72 hours or three days to generate a schedule and then you publish the schedule on Wednesday, did you look back at what happened on Monday and Tuesday to make sure <laughs> everything's still accurate? Oh gosh. And you know what? It's not. The I got to tell you that goes one... back and bites you. It's almost like you need someone to QC your schedule for you. I'm sure that's part of the process is okay, right. who's going to double check to make this, make sure this is accurate because you need right. like a second hand. And Again, if there's uh, any changes, right, you go to publish yeah. and then your team goes, oh, wait, hold on. You yeah. You put back even more because something, right? So say your team flags it, right? That team member doing inventory is like, wait, wait, wait. We're not getting the inventory for another two weeks. Hold on. Now you have to go back and still redo the schedule. Because it was built upon those inventory numbers. So you've caught the disruption. Now you still have to re reschedule because your operation still has to run. Right. I so, gotta say, like this master production schedule, it doesn't really seem that like it doesn't seem to make life that much easier. <laughs> when it, when you have one, it is, yeah. right? When you have one, it is, yeah. or, or or in principle, you know, yeah, you know, it is. Well, let's talk about like what, you know, how can manufacturers address some of these pitfalls? What would be kind of like the next step for them if they're running into a lot of like they're spending so much time managing this production schedule is, you know, what, what's a good solution for them? Tell us about, tell us about what you'd recommend. Yeah. I think if you're experiencing the pain, you have to address it head on, right? You. Mm -hmm the organization and your bottom line is going to suffer if you keep kicking the can and not addressing what's happening, right? If you're one person generating this schedule and you can't get it done and you can't get it done efficiently and you can't get something that's scalable for the business, you need to get some help. If you're managing a team, you have to make sure that the team has communication, has shareability, accountability, to make sure things are all working in unison and that there's no gaps or, you know, like our friend Dave, there's process, like identify the process yeah. on the teams oh, yeah. to make mm-hmm. sure they know exactly what to do if something or what if something were to happen, what are my five things I need to take care of types of types of items. Mm-hmm. Love that. When would advanced planning and scheduling software be a good fit for a manufacturer who's been managing their MPS, their master production schedule like help me help me understand who this makes sense for at what level of maturity are they there they in terms of their business maturity and all of that what what would you say there so the steps that we've identified using advanced planning and scheduling software can really cut out a lot of the steps because once the data and once the systems are connected it's really just updating fields, right? You're not manually going back and asking someone for an inventory number. The inventory number's in your systems of record already, 
right? You're not mm-hmm. just pulling from a random Excel spreadsheet that someone happened to update last Tuesday or this Tuesday or when you needed it. So you you really have to look at, and to answer your question, any company that's looking to mature their operation, right? Anyone that's looking to get on that digital transformation journey, right? If you're tired of managing an Excel spreadsheet that goes out to three constants and two vowels to get your schedule or get your production done, it's time to have a conversation, right? It's not Mm -hmm. scalable for your business. If you just can't get ahead of your operation and things keep on starting and stopping and stalling, and you feel like you just can't get above your head above water, it's time to have a conversation with a provider that can help you with this master production schedule so you can scale and grow and alleviate some of the d- disruptions and headaches to get these to get this schedule published for your operation. Oh, I have so many questions. Okay. So from a technology perspective, mm-hmm. you know, I imagine a lot of these organizations have different levels of tech, tech stack if you will. Mm -hmm. Some of them may be working with an ERP. Some of them may not have an ERP, right? That pulls in this information. Do you recommend, and Dave Chrysler has, I love planning people process technology, right? Technology always comes last. So let's just say you're a manufacturing facility and Mm -hmm. your planning's in place, your people, your process is all lined up and you're trying to get your tech stack all set up. Where does an APS software, advanced planning and schedule software, fall in that tech stack? Do you need to have other tech products, SaaS products established first before you use, you decide to invest in APS? Or help me understand, like, where does that fall in the process once you've got the people, the process, and the planning all in place? Yeah, the short answer is no. You don't have to have any amount of technology in your operation to kind of make this, make advanced planning scheduling software work. Mm -hmm. Uh, The right tools can take tribal knowledge or stuff that's on that big board or on those, in those notebooks and ingest it and take it as an input. Once you let us know, and once you let the provider know what this data means to the provider or to this, to the software itself. Mm -hmm. So if you say, I have my inventories on this sheet and my inventory is on in this word document or my inventory is mm. over here. It could be an ERP, whatever the, the, the tech stack is, the right provider should be able to work with the input, no matter what it is, whether it be tribal knowledge coming from an Excel spreadsheet, any documentation, CRM, ERP, it doesn't matter the maturity on the tech stack side of things. It's okay. understanding what lives where and what it means to the APS advanced planning scheduling software vendor. Okay. So the advanced planning and software, the the APS vendor, they're, they're really going to a good vendor is going to take the time to really understand what all of those inputs are. What are the, the, all the sources of truth, if you will, Mm -hmm. and create a bridge that pulls that data in consistently on a regular basis into the software. And that's going to be built out during implementation so that, ongoing it's just gonna it's basically like a a good APS vendor is gonna meet you where you are they're Mm -hmm. not gonna say well you've got to invest in this technology first in order for this to work they'll be able to make it work with whatever your your process is and build it out from there am I is that right right? absolutely and it it really depends on what you're hoping the the vendor can do for you right there's vendors that can help from the demand side just understanding Mm -hmm. demand right there's some people that don't want to look at their demand over the last two years. They just want to see it in a nice view. And then they want to see a forecast moving forward. They also, same thing with inventory. Don't tell me, don't, I don't want to guess what my inventory is. Just show me on a nice chart, what my inventory levels are. (laughs) Here's my restock levels. Here's my safety stock levels. Just give it to me over a month, a quarter and a year. That's it. That's all I want to see. And that's what the vendors work to do is understand the data and give the data in a digestible format but also to make it easier to manipulate, right? It's, it's easier because one of the big advantages is that the system is connected to the host systems of the client or it can become your new host system, right? Okay. So if you have to update inventory, you feed it and it becomes your system of record, right? And then, if you, and then if you mature and get an ERP or any other kind of um, uh, technology, make sure it can connect with it. This way you can understand what, what data is living where and what the data means. So it sounds like 
in order, you know, the partner, the client that's looking for this really needs to understand what their end goal is, what their requirements are up front and right. really clearly communicate those to say, you know, look, I really need to be focused on building this out to understand or make, make use of the data on con these specific constraints because this is the end result that I want to get. So, right. so in order for it to be set up for success, those clients really need to have a very clear vision of what right. they want that to accomplish and be very clear about the data points that they need to be ingested. Okay. Right. My next question about this is, oh, and I'm starting to lose it, but it's going to come back to me. How can this APS software, because there's so many fluid, so much of it is so fluid, right? Like changing all the time. And when you have an MPS, people have to manually go in there and change it. I mean, I guess this is the proprietary part of the, the software, but like, how is it able to just really just mm -hmm. understand the fluidity of these changes and, and how does it work that way without someone having to touch it somewhere or right. is, is that, a, is, you know, I'm, just I'm, trying to I'm with you. I follow. <laughs> yeah, no, it's really, so the right, the right vendor will take the time to get all the data points and all the information into the software to help make the best decisions moving forward. Okay. How you make the sauce, AI, machine learning, optimization mm -hmm. techniques. That's all the, that, that's all the back end kind that's of stuff. That's the wizardry. That's the wizardry that yeah. not for this call, maybe another one. You're if not going to tell me back. your secret sauce. I probably no. wouldn't understand it anyway, even if you told me. So. <laughs> but, but that's, but that's the beauty of the technology, right? And yeah. that's why it's always less because the planning people and process has to go before it. Right. Yeah. So once all the details are in the system, mm -hmm. if something were to change, the system learns and knows what is impacted as a result of. Right. Oh, so, so the system and the algorithm is designed to be able to have a holistic view of every other piece of information and make adjustments based on that correct. rather than having to manually go to every other organization. And uh, wow, cool. Right. So, mm -hmm. so for example, if you need four widgets to create a product, ABC mm -hmm. day, and yeah. you say, I'm going to have sufficient inventory level of all four, all four to make my product. But then something were to happen to one layer, right? So C. So say C has zero inventory, but it's going to be back online in two weeks. Yeah. The system already knows what's needed to make that finish good because it knows it needs all four widgets to make the final yeah. product. It also knows not to schedule because it can't schedule something that's not there, right? It's technology. Mm -hmm. It needs A, B, C, D. Without C, it's like cannot compute, right? It's like a... a you know, hashtag yeah. ref in, in Excel. It's like, what are you referring to? This, it, it can't happen. So the system then goes and looks and says, when is C back in stock, right? And if that mm -hmm. inventory level is back in stock in two weeks, that's when the finished goods going to get rescheduled because the system knows, nice. oh, A, B, C, D are now in sufficient quantities to create finished good. Okay, here's everything. And it's two weeks later, right? So it, it looks at all those parameters. Same way mm -hmm. as another example, if you were to pull an order forward, right? A manufacturer wants to over deliver for a client, right? You call me up and say, I need to have my, my widgets tomorrow. Okay, yeah. I can do that for you. But at what cost, right? What is that going to do to the rest of my operation? So yeah. in, the, in the software, you physically take the order and tell the system, make this a priority. Make this in front of everything else. And then it looks at it and says, okay, doing that is out of order but we know what's needed to create this finished good and since you're prioritizing over something else now as a result here's what the impacts are right this is mm -hmm. going to deplete item line c right so now everything for c is now not going to be able to be satisfied as originally intended because you pulled an order and that's going to starve out the inventory I level of, of item c so the the technology is told what to do and how to compute, right? Think of it, whenever you look at a keyboard, you the computer knows if you hit this key, that's A. You hit this key, that's W. You hit this key, that's escape. It knows the commands and the prompts because you're training it of what to do. And as the yeah. machine works, it learns. That's where the, like I said, the, the fancy stuff, not for this call, <laughs> gets in place. The AI and the machine learning, the optimization techniques take over. To where it's, oh, okay, the, the inventory level is being depleted. Here's my replenishment schedule. Everything's everything's going well. I can now see my, re my, my new schedule. Everything's off and running 
no big deal. Everything's fine. And I imagine with the machine learning, it's just going to get better and better over time and much more efficient over time in terms of being able to predict and forecast all of that. Right. So what do you see typically like from a time perspective, if you have an organization who's, you know, typically maybe they have a team of three or four people managing the, the production schedule and they mm -hmm. decide, you know what, we need to really advance in our maturity here. This is taking way too much time. What is the time savings that they're spending once they're able to move to an APS software um, to manage their, their, their production? The savings, it's, it, we're down to minutes, right? It's minutes mm -hmm. to generate this master production schedule instead of days. Wow. And it's minutes. So like anytime there's a change. Anytime. It doesn't take days. It just takes a right. few minutes. The software just, like I said, it it calculates everything at a, like supercomputer speeds, if you will. Yeah. But it it really cuts down days and hours to minutes, right? Then wow, we get into more advanced where teams of three and four say, well, now I can do more what if scenario management and yeah. I can actually look at other items. It's like, absolutely. You now have your master production schedule. There's nothing for you to worry about. You can plan for the unexpected and just mm. go to town, treat it like a sandbox, right? Yeah. Look at what happens if uh, seasonality, we got it wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Or what if something happens and some product goes viral and now all of a sudden we have to make three, four times what we need to. Well, now you can plan for that and you can look at it and you can understand that. So we get you out of the muck and mire, right? And you're not three days to generate something and then have to go back. Now it's you're looking ahead, right? We like to say you can pick your head up and actually look and help and have your organization be more efficient. Because now mm -hmm. when a disruption happens, you're minutes away from a schedule that can then be executed and feasible rather than hours or sometimes days. I mean, I'm just thinking about like days of an entire like production line waiting. I mean, just add up the hours, the time, the labor, the expense, the lost, you know, goods that you're not producing, the lost inventory, all, all of that. You add all of it up and that's significant just for one change, you right. know? For Man. one for one change. Yeah. And you're also the one you miss, not even a miss, but the one in there is the client, right? You're a yeah. manufacturer you have a client that's expecting something of you. Mm -hmm. And yeah. if you can't deliver, we'll go back to right. trust. That's, yeah. that's where that conversation comes into play. And the other beauty of the, the APS or advanced planning scheduling software is you were able to over and you're able to over communicate or communicate effectively changes, right? So now the conversation shifts. It's not, hey, Kurt, uh, we can't get you what we wanted. Uh, I'll let you know when we can get it done, but just bear with us. You know, you've been our client for a really long time. <laughs> just, just, just give me some time. Now the conversation is, Hey Kurt, just letting you know your order that was supposed to be here on Thursday. We have to push it to Monday. Here's why. Are you okay with that? I promise you there's nothing else that's going to go wrong. Monday's the new date. It's a different conversation. You can conversation. count on it. Yeah. You can count on it. The first mm -hmm. example we've had clients where they've just lost orders. Yeah. Right. If you, again, you, the manufacturer is servicing a client, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. If they can go someplace else that's going to get it to them, they're leaving, right? That yeah. revenue is gone. And then you know what? That client and that trust is gone as well. So that's another advantage of using the right vendor to kind of help you there. I mean, let's, so many drop the mic moments, because honestly, <laughs> that's the biggest advantage of all. At the end of the day, you're in business to serve your customers at the end of the day. And to mm -hmm. be able to establish trust with them and be reliable and dependable and, and get things to them in the time frame that they need and be very clear with them if there's a disruption that's going to impact that and be able to tell them the mm -hmm. day that, that, that it's going to work. Like as a customer, that instills trust in me. I feel like I can rely on you as a partner. So I, I mean, to me, that's like the, we're, cl we're coming down to the hour and I'm just like, well, that's the magic of yeah. this is that you're able to really be able to to be the hero for your customers. Absolutely. Um, man, this is sheesh. <laughs> <laughs> man, John, you got a huge sheesh right there. Like that, that, know. That's even Fantastic. better than a mic drop. That is better than a mic drop <laughs> even a major sheesh. So, oh, yeah. Nicole, how about like sanity check? 
pick your head yeah. up. I mean, they were just, oh my goodness. There was just so much. John, mm -hmm. this was a masterclass. And I like, I'm a logistics, I was a logistics major back in college. So, like I totally just geeked out right now. I have like a full page of notes. This was just so brilliant. I just, I, and, and you really shine a whole new light. You know, we've been friends for years now and, you know, I've always understood what you did, but I just, I really, you took it to a whole new level. So, mm -hmm. Hey, how about a big round of applause for John yeah. Cusino today for just dropping mic after mic. Is my, my, yeah. It's on the floor, Nicole. I know yours is right in front of you, but <laughs> you have to go buy a new one for the weekend. <laughs> No. Yeah. I think for John, you did such a great job explaining some of those major pitfalls that happen with a master of production schedule mm -hmm. and really outlined very, very clearly, you know, when APS is a good fit and how it can really transform a manufacturing facility. So thank you for no, uh, thank you. Nicole, how about, how about a little cheers to John. Cheers. How's cheers that? John uh, we got a at Uptessa. Thank you. Here's at our swag. And hey, John is like the king of swag. He's always sending us the good stuff. And it held up. It held it up. up. Yeah, it <laughs> held up. I was a little nervous, you know, because made my I, day. Oh, yeah. knows, like I'm not the most handy guy in the planet, but Nicole, I just you know, little handy, uh, you know, duct tape there. So <laughs> <laughs> now you have to update no. the team in Chicago and say, look. Yeah. No, I, this I is, listen. <laughs> and we got it. We got a we got a praise from Dave Chrysler. So that is oh, a thank you, Dave. Me. Dave, thank Dave, you. God bless you, brother. And we, we need it. Man, you. how about how about Dave Chrysler and Jen Alpha and John Baglino on the same stage, Nicole? That might be that a, would that be, might cool. be a good, because you know what? I'm a constraint. Yes. Last week we took a tour of a great manufacturer in Chicago, and mm -hmm. a gentleman was an efficiency expert. And John, you'll love we were talking about the book, The Goal. And just, he was walking through all the constraints that he's alleviating. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, like your software is just such a powerful, man, just be able to pick your head up and get a good night's sleep, you know, just, yeah. Mm -hmm. and so, you know what, like you're, you're like a sleep uh, provider, you know, like you can help. <laughs> like, you know? sleep provider. like you're almost like a therapist, John Buglino, who, who knew that John had that in him. He's just a therapist. <laughs> so anyway, oh, let's start yeah. winding down. So hey, no program this week on Friday. So we're taking a little holiday. And so Damon is off. He's enjoying some family time. Nicole has a big wedding that she's going to. I'm going to be spending some family time. John, what do you have planned for the fourth? Anything fun, exciting with the family? Just barbecue and friends. That's really, barbecue that's really friends. it. Nice. That's all I need. That's the last, last mic drop of the moment right there. So Nicole, any parting words, words of wisdom? You know, I have a question I've been dying to ask John. I don't have any parting words, but just this one last question for John. Just this one last one. John, if you were a spirit animal, <laughs> what would you be? <laughs> so the spirit animal, and I've answered this before, is an eagle. An eagle. I like soaring above. I like looking further out. Big yeah, plan, big vision I see it. type you know item. Who's an eagle with you? This guy over here. He's an eagle too. That's it. But That's for cool. a totally, completely different reason, Mr. John Buglino. <laughs> like you're, you're rocking that great head of Italian hair. And so I prefer to myself as the ego because of this, you know, so I'm the, I'm the bald ego, but you're just, you're, you're soaring high. So anyway, we're at time. We will wind down. John, thank you. Seriously. This yeah. was thank just, you guys. just pure gold masterclass, just so much fun. And uh, thank you, my friend. We appreciate, we send warm wishes and just an incredible safe weekend to everybody out there. Thank yes, you guys in the chat. Box. Thank you for joining us today. If you're just coming in, you. wait, go back and catch a replay because this was pure gold. So happy fourth, God bless. And last thing, man, just go out and be somebody's inspiration, just like our dear friend, John Baglino, because man, this mm -hmm. was just pure inspiration here. So thank you guys. And we'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye.